I want to give a special thank you for Center for Community Wealth Building and Colorado SBDC for having me. We are going to have some fun tonight. We're going to talk about a topic that's a little scary for business owners, but my hope is that by the end of the presentation, everyone feels a little bit better, a little bit more prepared. Um, and that we can face this tax season without fear. So I will ask that everyone mute themselves for me. That way we don't, uh, everyone can hear the presentation well. And um, we have my wonderful colleague, Teresa here. If you have questions while I'm presenting, please feel free to just drop them in the chat. She is a veteran in the tax and accounting world and is very, very knowledgeable. And she'll be able to ask or answer any questions that you may have we are gonna also have a Q&A at the end so we can expand on any of those, but don't hesitate to drop them as I'm presenting. So first things first, let's see if I can get it done. I um, I created an overview of what we're gonna cover today. Um, Kevin, you did an awesome intro for me. My name is Ariel Ramsey and I am the owner of Easy Tax Denver. I'm gonna kind of breeze past my intro because this is not about me, this is about taxes. So the very first thing that I wanna talk about is do I need an accounting professional? And I wanted to open it up to the audience because you guys are the small business owners here. Can I just have a couple people chime in, come off your mute for a second? Do you feel that you need an accounting professional to do your taxes? I really wanna know. No, I don't. Okay, anybody else? No, I don't know. Okay, All right, can I get some whys <laughs> too? I, I like the no, but I wanna hear a why. Why do you feel like you don't? I say yes and no. I think that it depends on the knowledge that you have and the self-esteem that you have to be able to accomplish it and make sure you're doing it correctly. Okay, I love that answer. Yes, that was a good one. One more. I want one more. I think Somebody yes, now that I have a converted to an S-Corp. Okay, yes, that's an excellent answer as well. So you really touched on what I wanted to gather is the answer really is it depends, right? There's a couple of different situations that would cause you to need an accounting professional. But before you can even really dig into what accounting professional you need, you have to understand that there are many different types of accounting professionals. And so we really wanted to capture the four main accounting professionals that small businesses may end up utilizing and really understand the differences between the two. Because as an accounting professional, I found that sometimes what I do is misunderstood understood. Um, and so there's really four types that small business owners can really utilize depending on their needs. Um, the first one is a bookkeeper, right? And a bookkeeper does kind of the day-to-day -day task. They're organizing the financial records, meaning that they're working with the day-to-day -day transactional data. And then oftentimes they'll assist with payroll. They can do other tasks as well, but they're really working with that day-to-day um, transactional data and organizing it into categories so that it's ready for an accountant. And we'll get into the accountant um, bubble as well. The tax preparer is a whole different beast, right? They're really doing data entry from the scope of um, working with a specific tax software. I haven't met a tax professional that just does it in their own mind. Most of them are working within software um, and they're utilizing the information that you provide to them. So they're really doing data entry to create tax returns, okay? Um, an enrolled agent is a form of tax preparer. The only difference is that they have gone through a process with the IRS to be designated, meaning the IRS um, will list them as well um, as a designated tax preparer, and they took a test. So they're kind of like a tax preparer that is certified in a sense. And then you have what's called a CPA, which I'm sure a lot of you guys have interacted with CPAs. CPA stands for Certified Public Accountant, and they are licensed by the National Association of State Board of Accountancy. So every state has their own board. Um, and this is, again, an accountant who is certified. So you can have a plumber that knows how to do plumbing, and then you can have a, uh, and they can be a great plumber. They can 
get the job done. They can give you everything that a certified plumber can do. The difference is that one is certified and one is not. So I really thought it was important um, that we capture kind of the differences between the different accounting professionals, because you may say, no, I don't need a CPA, but you might need a bookkeeper to help you organize your finances, or maybe you're organizing them on your own, but you don't really know about tax strategy. You don't know about tax write-offs. You don't know about um, how to use a tax software. So you may utilize an EA or a CPA to do your taxes. So um, moving right along, um, I think it's important to address some of the pros and cons of hiring an accounting professional. Um, and, you know, as an accounting professional, I will never say there's a con of working with, uh, with a person like me who works with the numbers all day. Um, I think that we're, we're very useful. We're very great, but depending on the size of your business and what's going on in your business, you may not need to work with an accountant and that's it could be a cost savings for you so that's one of the the pros um, of working with a a, a Attack, an accountant is that you're going to have some ease. You're going to have some accuracy. This is their profession, right? You can always DIY it, but you're never going to be 100% sure that it's correct. When you outsource to a professional, you'll have that ease of, um, that peace of mind knowing that that is a professional that did your work. Um, one of the cons though, is that professionals do cost money. And sometimes as small business owners, we're really looking for ways to minimize our, expense, our expenses and maximize our revenue. Um, and then also, I know as a small business owner, in the beginning, I really struggled with delegation. I wanted to wear all the hats in my business. And so giving someone to some, giving something to someone else can feel like a loss of control. It can feel like something, right? And so, um, when you do it yourself, you get to save money and you get a learning experience, which I'm a huge advocate of all business owners knowing how to do these things and then having the decision or making the decision on whether or not they want to do it. But ultimately, you should know from a general standpoint how to do your bookkeeping. Um, the con of the major con of DIY doing it yourself is it's time consuming. And a lot of us are doing too much already as business owners. Can you add another thing to your plate? Um, and then if you do make an error and you have to hire a professional, then sometimes it's costly to, to correct those errors. So these are all considerations to think about whether you hire an expert or you do it yourself. That's not a wrong, there's no right or wrong ways to do it. But tonight we're going to talk about some ways to to do either one of those better, whichever path you choose. So um, the last kind of part of that question is, you know, what, what does my business require? And sometimes the easiest way to determine if you really do need an accounting professional um, is to understand what your business, like what size your business is in or what size your business is and what phase it's in. So when we're getting organized, you know, sometimes it can look like this. And I found this picture online. I thought it was funny. We all have a box like this in our office, right? Am I the only one? I'm an accountant. And I even have a box like that in my office. That's a little bad, right? But um, I think it's important to recognize that when we're running a business, sometimes things get like this, where it's just a pile of receipts, right? If you are a tiny business, that pile of receipts is probably a small box that if you dedicated three or four hours um, a month to it, you could create your and organize your finances and create a simple profit and loss. And you don't need a, an accounting professional. If you're a small business and that box is now starting to add up to like a box a month, um, or just in general, you're feeling like you have you know, more than 150 transactions per month, you may benefit from using a spreadsheet template or a very basic, easy to use software to create your profit and loss. But in order for us to get organized, we are going to have to face those da that data. If you're a large or medium-sized business, I'm really going to advise you to use bookkeeping software. And if you can afford it, to hire a bookkeeper because it's going to make your life a lot easier. It's going to become a huge task for you to have to do that on your own. So um, getting organized really does depend on how much tr transactional data that you really have. If you're that tiny business that has one vendor 
and um, you know, you're really not making that much revenue yet. You're in that startup phase, or you're in that space where you know the business isn't going to grow. It's it's more of a thing that's going to stay in that bubble. You probably don't need to outsource that. But if you've got employees, if you're an S corporation, if you're dealing with large volumes of, of transactional data, it's going to benefit you to use a system and and uh, rather than recreate the wheel yourself, utilize a system that's out there already. So let's keep going. So now that we kind of understand if we want um, or need to have an, a tax professional or an accounting professional, let's talk about what we can write off. Because um, a lot of times I, I talk to small business owners and that's a huge question. They're like, well, I don't even know what a write-off is. Like, what do you, you know, can I write this off? Can I write that off? And the answer is it really is depending on your business. So the IRS defines a write-off as any expense that is both ordinary and necessary for your business to operate, right? And so if I'm running a business, a construction company, then my write-offs are going to be different than a restaurant, okay? And so um, there's no like general answer to this question. It really does depend on your business, the industry that you're in, and how you operate that specific business. Now, there are several write-offs that are common among all businesses, right? Um, and these are some of them. I, I have two slides, and I want to just kind of go through these and talk about what they look like, because sometimes we're like, well, what is average? Like, you see that word, but you're like, what, what falls under that? And um, as a bookkeeper, I see these transactions every day. And so it's easy for me to kind of give you names of vendors that might ring a bell that you're actually engaging with that will fit into these categories. So for advertising, a lot of the times I'll see individuals who are using Wix or GoDaddy, um, hosting their websites, the fees that they paid to build the website. Um, if they're using Google ads, Facebook ads, all of those things kind of lump into advertising. If you paid for the grocery cart to have your ads, um, all of those things that you do to get the word out about your business that you pay for is going to all go into advertising. Office supplies, those are going to be our purchases from Staples, um, Office Depot, Amazon Business. Some of us are going to actually go to Walmart or Target to get office supplies. Now, one of the things that a lot of my business owners struggle with with office supplies is keeping them separate, right? Because when I go to that trip at Walmart, I might need to get some milk for my babies. I might, might need some eggs for my refrigerator, but I also need these Sharpie markers and that um, calendar for my desk. I highly recommend that you separate those transactions. And I used to have a lot of anxiety. I would be at the grocery store and I have my business stuff and my stuff for my home. And I'm going to now, I'm going to encourage you because I'm doing this myself to ask that the person that's checking you out to separate your transactions. Um, and if you are at the point where you have a business bank account, utilize your business bank account to purchase the business supplies and your personal bank account to purchase. Um, purchase the um, in the stuff for your home. It's going to make your bookkeeping and your record keeping so much easier. But I also get it. Sometimes that line is, it feels like a lot of pressure. You're like, oh my goodness, these people are going to judge me if I'm taking too long and I just going to do it all together. If that's who you are and that's how you're going to do it, then I recommend that you do save that receipt highlight the items that were for business, take a picture so that receipt doesn't fade away and make sure that you are separating those transactions because they do add up. And the biggest thing that we want to prepare for is in the event of an audit, how do we back up the purchases that we're writing off? Okay. And so we don't want to have these large trips that are mixing in our business and our personal to those vendors like Walmart, Amazon, places where you can get a lot of stuff that may not be for business. We do want to make sure that we're separating those out. Um, insurance. A lot of us are required to have insurance for our businesses. Um, and, you know, there's so many companies. I think Next is one that's like really popular right now. There's one called Lemonade, um, Hartford, um, progressive, all of these companies that do business insurance, but also if you're using your vehicle for business, you can write off that as well. So that's a very, again, broad category, but it depends on your business. Um, if you have a brick and mortar and you are renting, um, you can write that off. If you own a business that operates in your home, you can write off a portion of your rent based on the size of your um, 
home office compared to your or the percentage that's used. So if your home is a thousand square feet and your office is 200, then you can write off 20% of your home rent. Um, legal and professional, that is the bookkeeper, that is the lawyer, that is the consultant. Those are these the individuals that we pay for services that are usually outside or outsourced. They're going to go into that legal and professional phone utilities. All of that makes sense. Software. Um, this is an interesting one because Right. We live in a day and age where there's so many, um, I call it software as a service, right? Um, companies that sell software that helps uh, us as business owners to automate our lives. QuickBooks Online is one. MailChimp is another one. Um, there's so many I could go on and on. Zapier is one that I pay for to do some automation. Um, and a lot of these charges are recurring. So if you're paying for recurring software, you can write those off. Applications as well. So within my business, we uh, play Spotify to create a vibe within, within the office. And so I can write off that Spotify subscription because I do use it for business. And there are other apps that I utilize on my phone um, to help enhance my business, those qualify as software as well. Um, supplies and office supplies are very similar. A lot of the times I have business owners ask like, what's the difference? Um, and there really isn't a huge difference. You can group all of your supplies into office supplies, or if you have specific supplies for your specific industry, um, you can write those, separate those categories. Contract labor, we'll talk a little bit more about this. Um, repairs, if you've had to do things to fix up. And then a lot of these ones are self-explanatory as well. I'm gonna zoom in on a few that I think are worthwhile to talk about. And I call them the gray area um, expenses. And so the first one is um, meals and entertainment. So we're no longer able to write off entertainment. There once was a time where you could court clients, you could take them to the Rockies game and um, it, write off that expenditure related to the actual cost of the game that's no longer allowed. We're only able to write off meals. And there are some restrictions surrounding meals. And in audits, this is the area that I see a lot of business owners get hung up. And so I thought it's worthwhile to talk about because um, a lot of us as business owners, we're out and about, we get coffee, we get our lunch, we're eating while we're working. That's a write-off, right? Not quite. Okay. So for the meals, we have to really be engaging in that meal to conduct business. So, so sometimes we may have a meeting over lunch with a client, a prospective client, a teammate, those are things that we can write off, but just feeding ourselves to, um, as we run our business, we're unfortunately not able to write that off. And so we want to be really mindful of that. And I really tell my business owners to, because it's a gray area, to be very mindful of how they operate. So my recommendation is if you ever are um, having a meal for business is to take a picture of the receipt, um, but before you take a photo of it, write down who was there and what, just a general thing, what you guys discussed, take a photo of that for your records, because I have seen in audits where those meals, um, the meal expenditure is high, the IRS starts digging into it, they want to see receipts, they want to see proof that you were actually meeting for business. And a lot of the times it's hard for business owners to prove that. So if you write down who was there and kind of from a general perspective, what you covered, outsourcing to China, had a meeting at Ocean Prime um, with Joe and Bob, and take a picture of that, put that away. I think that that's a really good way to make sure that your documentation is in order. After you've taken a photo of the receipt, you don't have to keep that big box of receipts. You can um, shred those receipts, but I would recommend having like a drive or somewhere that you keep those receipts. And then that other gray area is travel because we are living in a day and age where our businesses don't have the same bounds that they used to, right? Um, especially me as a bookkeeper, I do a lot of traveling. I have clients in New York and sometimes I will go there, but I also like to have fun in New York, right? And so what I like to do is really take a percentage of how much of my time was spent for business and then how much was spent for personal. And then I will write off the expenditures such as the hotel and the flight accordingly. I do actual for the business, um, like meals, if I'm having meals with business, potential partners or clients, I write those off as they truly are. Meaning if the meal was $20, I don't write off 80% because I was 
80% for business and 20 for personal, I'll write off 100% of that meal or I'll take that deduction. Um, but the flight and the ride share and things like that, I will um, write off at, based on the percentage of how much of my time was spent for business or personal. So those are kind of the gray areas that I like to talk about. If you guys have questions about the other expenditures, we can get into that. But for the sake of time, I want to keep rolling. So uh, we talked about expenses. Let's talk about income, because I also have a lot of business owners that are like, well, I'm not going to get any 1099s for that, so I don't have to claim it. It's better to claim all your income. I, I really recommend claiming 100% of your business income, um, whether or not you receive a 1099 for it or not. Um, it is important that you claim all of your business income. Understating your revenue is considered tax fraud, and we don't want to play around with that at all. So um, it's really important that we're documenting that, even if you are a cash-based business. And I think a lot of businesses that deal with a lot of cash feel like there's kind of room to not claim it all. I highly recommend that you claim it all. Um, and so we really work on a calendar year. So anything that was received between January 1 and December 31 needs to be claimed. Again, if you're running a cash business, you're going to have to put some systems into place to, to record that cash. A lot of us business owners that accept credit cards or um, debit cards, that's already getting recorded within the merchant processing system. But cash is, you know, it's exchanged hand to hand and it's your responsibility to, to track it and claim all of your revenue. Um, there are two different types of accounting that you can utilize. There are cash-based and then there is accrual-based. And a lot of times when people see cash-based, they think of businesses that are just exchanging cash. No, cash versus accrual is an accounting terminology. And what it means is when you're operating a cash-based business, you claim any revenue that is earned at that moment. Accrual I'm sorry, we, we, you claim, I'm sorry, let me make sure I say that right. Cause this was the part in college that used to always confuse me. I was like, what? <laughs> so I want to make sure I explain it well. So cash-based accounting means that we record the revenue at the moment that the cash is exchanged. So let's say you sell t-shirts. I go into your business. I order 30 t-shirts. I pay for my t-shirts. You would recognize that you earned that money right then. An accrual business um, it, it, the difference with the accrual business is that they recognize revenue when the transaction happens. So let's just say I would call your business. I don't come in. I call your business. I order 30 t-shirts. You create an invoice. I haven't paid for the t-shirts quite yet, but as soon as you created that invoice, you recognize the revenue and it gets counted into your calculation of income. Now, I may never show up and pay for those t-shirts. And so there is a way that you can write that off if you're an accrual-based business. Um, but the, again, the difference between cash-based business is a cash business wouldn't claim that revenue until the cash is actually in their hand, where accrual would claim it as soon as I place that order. And you will know if you're doing cash or accrual. If you're doing accrual basic accounting, you probably have an accountant of involved. Um, and there may be invoices that are unpaid at the end of the year that you're able to write off as uncollectible. Um, and so it's important to understand what type of accounting you're actually doing um, if you do have an accountant involved so that you're not understating your revenue. Um, if you are operating a business and you have multiple partners involved, um, if, if people that you're other business, if you're doing business to business, that's a better way to say it, you may receive a 1099 NEC, which stands for non-employee compensation or a 1099 miscellaneous. And so um, I, it's very important to wait until after January 31st because you are legally, uh, the, those partners that you may work with are legally required to get those 1099s to you before the third on or before the 31st. If you file your taxes before the 31st, you may file them without understand or without incorporating revenue that was claim um, that was on those 1099s. So it's important to make sure you have all your documents. Okay, um, if you have employees, 
it's important that there's a set of processes that you have to do as an employer. And I thought it was really important for us to first talk about what is an employee, right? Because sometimes we have people working for us and we pay them, but they're not quite employees. And so um, I have two slides to kind of talk about the difference between a subcontractor and an employee. So an employee is gonna have a set schedule. They may be required to wear, like you can tell your employee that they have to wear a t-shirt with your logo on it. Um, but a contractor can also wear a uniform. So that's not a hundred percent. If you're wearing a uniform, they're an employee. Um, when you hire someone as an employee, they fill out what's called form W-4. And that form is going to tell you as the employer how much taxes to withhold and remit to the IRS. So as an employer, you will withhold taxes on behalf of your employee and you will you are responsible for remitting those taxes to the IRS. And then at the end of the year, you're also responsible to provide form W-2 to your employee. If you have contractors or subcontractors, as we sometimes call them, um, they will sometimes fit into this criteria. So they won't have a set schedule for their work. Um, they may or may not wear a uniform. They, they can wear a uniform if they want to, but you can't force a contractor to wear a uniform um, unless it's in your contract. But usually most contractors won't um, agree to that. They fill out what's called Form W-9. Um, and using that Form W-9, you will create a 1099 NEC if you paid them more than $600 in the calendar year. So from January to December, if you paid an individual who was not an employee more than $600, you are required to provide them a 1099 NEC. You don't withhold taxes. It's their responsibility to withhold um, and remit their own taxes. So um, there's always a lot of confusion around the employee versus subcontractor conversation, but I felt like this really does capture kind of the differences between the two and your responsibilities as a business owner to either party. Okay, so what about if you paid yourself? I wanna hear, I, I need to see a show of hands. How many business owners in the room paid themselves in 2022? Come on, let me see, where's those hands at? Anybody pay yourself? Nobody paid themselves? Hold on, let me see, maybe I can't see the controls. I don't think, I think that's the problem. Hold on, I'm just going to take a quick survey. Okay, I see a couple hands in there. People paid themselves. Um, this is one of the biggest challenges for small businesses is that, you know, the business is rolling, it's it's moving, it's got expenses, you got income coming in. And sometimes it's like, can I take some money? I, I got bills to pay. Um, how do, and, and, and when I do it, how do I do it? So um, I made a very simple slide to kind of articulate the two ways that as a business owner, you can pay yourself. You can do distributions or you can do payroll. So um, distributions are when we take money from the business without paying taxes on it. And this is really a good fit for small businesses that, in my opinion, are working under like the $60,000 range to take what we call draws from the business. Um, and a lot of small business owners have a lot of anxiety surrounding taking draws from the business. They're like, do I transfer the money to myself? Do I write a check to myself? Should I just take the business card and um, go buy myself something nice? I, I've been working hard, right? Um, I recommend that you transfer the money from your business account to your personal account to, for distributions, or you write yourself a check. I don't recommend commingling your personal and your business expenses. It happens sometimes. Sometimes you have an expense and the money is in the business account, but it is not the best hygienic financial business practice. The best thing that you can do is move that money to your personal account. Um, and it helps us as a bookkeeper. I don't want to see all your personal stuff. I don't, you know, I want to help you. I want to get you organized, but I want you to keep your personal stuff separate. So um, some of those things that um, I typically see when there is, we call it co-mingling when you're mixing your business and your personal daycare um, expenditures, um, date night expenditures, you know, the money's in the bank and it's just easier to take your, your partner out on a date with those, uh, with the business funds, um, rent, home rent, um, being charged on their home, car, um, home, what is it called? Sorry. My brain just went blank. <laughs> Sorry, guys. Um, 
car notes for that are personal for personal vehicles, car insurance for personal vehicles, those kind of things that really should come out of your personal account. Let's really try to commit to that in 2023 to keep those things separate. So um, if your business is over that $60,000 threshold, you can convert into an S corporation and put yourself on payroll. There will be a huge cost savings from you, for you. And I'm not going to get into the nitty gritty of it, but I do recommend that if you're interested in saving some money on your taxes to really look at the advantages of um, converting your business into an S corporation and then understanding some of the disadvantages and it's really the responsibilities. Payroll can be expensive. And so I always, when I have a business owner that's interested in converting to a S corporation and running payroll, we do a cost benefit analysis, meaning we look at what is it actually going to cost you to run this payroll. One of the things that you have to do is put yourself on what's called a reasonable salary. And that can be um, a, a very gray area where you definitely want to have a comp uh, a accounting professional involved in that conversation. So um, I'm not going to go down that rabbit hole, but I did just want to touch on it. If you're interested in the S Corp conversation, I do recommend having that conversation with an accounting professional because um, they can really show you dollar for dollar, like what your savings are using your historical performance and using that as a gauge. It's hard to kind of just give you a general number. I, I like to really look at how did you perform last year and what it would have looked like if you were an S Corp that you put yourself on payroll. Okay, so we've got a little bit of time. I'm gonna, um, I've got about 10 more minutes and then I'm gonna open it up for um, question and answer. I wanted to talk about some of the important tax updates and this is where people start snoring. So please grab some coffee, open your eyes. If you got to tape them open, do so because this stuff is important. Um, we are dealing with a major shift this tax year and um, we've already started doing tax returns at Easy Tax, and we're having people like grabbing their chest like, whoa, that looks way different than last year. Um, we lost a lot of credits. So last year was a tax season that was heavily, heavily dependent on a lot of the um, stimulus and economic support that happened after COVID. There were laws put, put, placed in order to really support our economy, and they flowed into our tax um, laws as well. And those laws are gone. And so we're kind of back to resetting to how things were. And so I wanted to touch on some of these differences so that you guys aren't surprised because many of us, if you are not an S corporation and you're running a business where you um, are, you're an LLC or an independent business owner, you're going to file what's called um, a Schedule C, which is integrated into your personal tax return. So we're going to be dealing with your personal situation and your business situation. And it's important to understand how the personal credits are going to affect you and the business credits are going to affect you, the changes. So the first one is the child tax credit. Last year, it was amazing. I have two kids myself and I was very thrilled. Um, <laughs> this year, it is not so great. It's back to kind of where it was before. Um, if you guys remember last year, they were giving us um, monthly payments from, or I'm sorry, I'm saying last year, but I should be saying 2021. From July to December, if you had children under the age of 10, I believe, you were getting, um, I don't remember the age range, it was three, $300 from six to 10 if they were under 10 or something like that. I don't remember exactly what the age ranges were, but we were getting monthly payments. Um, and the child tax credit was $3,600. And now that credit is down to 2000 and only 1500 of that 2000 is refundable. Um, and so that's gonna decrease refunds a lot. We also had a dependent care credit. So if you were paying for a daycare, um, if you had two children, you could claim 4,000 per child and the maximum credit was $8,000 refundable. It is now back to 3,000 at the maximum. Um, we also had our stimulus payments. We had them in 2020 and we had them in 2021. And if you did not receive your stimulus money, you could claim that on your taxes. This year, you're not able to claim those stimulus payments on your taxes if you didn't receive them. 
Um, we also had a COVID tax credit for self-employed individuals in 2021. That credit is, is gone. It was really cool. Um, and I thought it was a great way for them to um, allow us individual business owners or individuals who may have had COVID to claim that time loss, but that credit's not there anymore. Um, this year is the last year to claim 100% bonus depreciation of assets. And this specific tax credit has a lot of gray area surrounding it. There's two tax credits that I see a lot of business owners who use their vehicles in business utilize. And this is one, and then section 179, beyond the scope of this conversation. But if you're using your vehicle for business, if you used it last year, I definitely recommend that you talk to your accounting professional about how you can utilize this last year of 100% bonus depreciation. Um, 2021, we also had 100% deductible meals. No longer, we're going back to 50%. So there's a lot of changes. Um, and again, some of those things are it would we could go we could go down a rabbit hole if you wanted to, but it's beyond the scope of this conversation. So if you have specific questions about certain changes, uh, we can save some of that for the Q and A. I'm going to move on to some of the important deadlines, and uh, I'm just so grateful that we got to gather here today because. Uh, the deadline for our 1099s and W-9s is the 31st of January. So if you're a small business owner and you paid employees and you haven't gotten your W-2s, you still have time to get those to your employees. They have to receive them by the 31st. So that means don't send them on the 31st. You got to get them to them by the 31st. And a lot of us mail them. Um, but you can use digital platforms and they, there's a lot of companies that can assist you with filing these forms in a smooth way so that your employee's information is protected um, and they get it by the 31st. Same with 1099. So if you're in that bubble where you're like, oh, I did pay people, I paid employees and I paid contractors over 600, make sure you get them to them by the 31st. If you are an S corporation, you have until the 15th of March to, um, that's your deadline. And I think that's just so weird. I don't know. I don't understand. I wish, I feel like as corporations should have an extra month, like their deadline should be May 15th. Um, but if you decide to extend, you can push it back to September 15th. And I think this is why it's really important if you're running an S Corp to get organized, get in touch with your accounting professional sooner rather than later, because your time ticks a lot faster than the individual or the C corporation clock. Um, individuals in C corps, you have until the 18th of April. And if you decide to do an extension, you have to the 15th of October. So um, those are, we have plenty of time, but I want everyone to know that for us accounting professionals, it gets cray cray around this time. So don't wait to the last minute and, um, you know, if you've been neglecting it all year, don't get frustrated with us if we have to, you know, take our time to go through it because um, this is our busy season. And so the more that you can do to prepare and help us by getting organized, the better. You're going to get better service by not just bringing a messy box of receipts, okay? Um, if you can even organize them by month, it just, those little gestures really do help if you do decide to work with the accounting professional. But um, I... Sorry. Did someone have a question? Okay, sorry. I'm going to keep going. So that was my last slide. We are, um, I'm like two minutes ahead. I was trying to make sure I got through all my slides by 615. And so here we are at the Q&A. I've been seeing the chat jump in. Um, I wanted to, Teresa, you've been doing a great job answering it. Um, yeah. Was... <clears throat> That accrual versus cash was kind of, I, I I think I caused a little confusion there. Do you want to kind of articulate a little bit to help clear that up? I could try. Okay. <laughs> um, so here's what it happens. Think of it this way. If you're a small business and you did great your first year, you did a lot of sales, except say $100,000 in sales. But only 10% of the people have paid you, which means you've only collected $5,000. If you're doing your taxes in accrual, it means that the moment I invoice somebody, 
I have to count that as income, whether I've received the money or not. So can you imagine being a small business if you had sales of 100000 but you only had income of 5000 because only a few people have paid you? You would have to pay taxes on the full 100000 in sales. So because that's difficult for small businesses, most of the small businesses will file in cash basis, which means the moment I receive the money, that is money that is taxable to me. I hope, I don't know if it helps. Same with expenses. Um, I put a small example in the chat. If you hire somebody to fix your computer in December and they invoice you, but you haven't paid them, if you're on a cash basis, you count that expense in 23 because you paid them in January. If you're on a cruel basis, the moment they invoice you, you can count that expense, even if you haven't paid them, which sounds nice, except for the part that I said first, which is if you're on a cruel and you invoice somebody, now you count it as income, whether you've received the money or not. And for small businesses, that's different. It is. That was beautiful. Thank you for articulating that. So uh, like I said, when I was studying it, it used to like, I did it, but it's hard to make it make sense. So I appreciate <laughs> you for articulating that so beautifully. Most small business owners really don't worry about accrual accounting. That's more when you get to the medium, large size business um, side, and you definitely need an accounting professional involved if you're dealing with accrual accounting. You have another question. Um, when do we have to send or receive 1099s? In what circumstances? For example, I hired a grant writer. Do they need a 1099 from me? That's a beautiful question. So, um, and I should have covered that. Thank you for asking that. Um, the general rule is that if you pay an individual or an LLC, you are required to provide them with the 1099. And so what, why we utilize the W-9, my practice, and I tell all my small business owners is before you pay anyone for services, you want to make sure that you collect a W-9 because you don't know if you actually need to 1099 them until you review the W-9. So on that W-9, I'll actually pull up a blank one so that we can kind of take a look at it together and you guys can kind of reference what I'm talking about. Um, okay, I'm going to pull this slide over. Can you guys still see, see my screen? Okay, so this is Form W-9. It's a blank one here. And here in these check boxes, the individual or the business will indicate how they're operating. So if they select this box here or partnership, we want to, or even, yeah, no, no, so yeah. If they select these two here, we want to 1099 them. They may select this one and they can put a P here for partnership. We would also 1099 them. We do not 1099 C corporations or S corporations. Those are the ones that don't get them. Um, Teresa, do, do you know, I've, I've actually never seen a W-9 with that box check, trust slash estate. I'm actually gonna make this bigger so everyone can see it. Um, do we 1099 in the event? We do. Yeah. Okay, cool. Um, so yeah, that is an excellent question. And so the rule of thumb that I have is collect a W-9 no matter what, because I'd rather have it and not need it than need it and not have it. Many of us are in the position where we did not collect the, 10, the W-9s. You have until the 31st to get those 1099s to the individuals. And so it's your job now to reach out to anyone that you paid over $600 to and ask them to complete the Form W-9. The reason why I recommend that you do it before you ever pay them is that sometimes you can have a very hard time getting people to respond to the request for the Form W-9 after you've paid them, where if before you've paid them, they're a little bit more anxious to get paid. And so they'll do that actual paperwork more willingly versus after you've paid them, it can be hard to hunt people down and get them to fill out this form. Um, if you cannot get them to fill out the form, uh, meaning you just are not able to reach them, maybe the email address that you have on file or the address that you have on file is not working, you're unfortunately not able to 1099 that individual. 
Um, you can still write it off on your taxes, but if you were to ever get audited, the IRS may question why you did not submit a 1099. Um, do 1099s or Form W-9s apply to 501c nonprofit organizations? So if you are operating a 501c3, you still have to do 1099s. Um, if you are... Um, operating or if you are if you paid it a, a a nonprofit organization in most cases you will a lot of nonprofits are organized as c corps though so you wouldn't have to and so it's interesting that this form doesn't have that box for nonprofit organization um but they are they have a whole different tax structure so um i think that that's the reason why that it's not there do you agree teresa um, because usually nonprofits are not going to be doing work for you. And if they did, that would go under a completely different part of their tax return. I think that's why it's not listed here because we're not. Yeah. They're, they're, for, they're not for profit. They're not supposed to be working for you. Right. They might take donations from you, but they're not supposed to be working for you. Exactly. And if you do give them money, then you're typically going to get a, um, like a tax write-off. What do they call the, the document? It's like a 501Cs give them, if you've made a donation to you, it's like a tax write-off certificate. You'll see them from churches or other nonprofits that you've made uh, tax donation receipt. Thank you, Susan. You're awesome. <laughs> <laughs> My tongue is just in knots tonight. Um, you got another question. If you could go over the Colorado Secure Saving Plan and the Family Leave Act. I that is beyond my scope. I would I defer to you on that, Teresa. I've got a little bit more research to do. I'm here to learn too. Um, so there's there's two new things that Colorado is doing for employees this year. Um, one is called Family, um, F A M L I. Mm -hmm. And that is, we're all going to contribute from our paycheck a small percentage. It's half a percent that we're going to contribute. Um, and this goes into a savings. Everybody contributes. It goes into a savings. The state will keep that savings. And then if you're ever in a situation where, say, you had a baby, um, you have some unfortunate circumstances, and you have an extended period of time in which you need um, medical leave. You can go to the state, kind of like how we go to the state right now and say, hey, I'm unemployed. I need to withdraw from my unemployment insurance. With family, you don't have to necessarily lose your job. You just go to the state and say, hey, I've run out of PTO and I need to take more time. And of course, they're going to ask for doctor's notes and all kinds of evidence and whatnot. But once you're approved, you get paid um, on a regular basis. I don't know if it's weekly or whatever. It'd be similar to unemployment. You get paid on a regular basis so that you're not without income during this time. Now, as business owners, this is great for employees, right? But as business owners, this creates an additional burden because you're not allowed to fire this person. You must hold their position open until they are able to return to work. You can hire somebody temporarily to do their work, but you cannot um, fire them. You have to keep their job. You don't have to pay them during this time because that came out of the insurance that we've all been paying over time. If you're an employer that has five or more employees, then you also have to contribute to this. It's kind of like unemployment insurance. Again, it's, it's very similar. Um, the Colorado Secure Savings Plan, that one is kind of like a retirement thing, like a 401k. And that is intended saying, hey, we are concerned that people are not putting money into their 401k. So right now, um, or, or now, they have to register by like May of this year is the latest. Um, you, If you're an employer and you're not offering some kind of retirement plan, then you must enroll your employees in the Colorado Secure Savings Plan. There is a, a little safe box for small businesses. If you have an, 
don't quote me on this one because the number does escape me. I believe it's less than 10 employees. It's around there, five or 10 employees. Then you don't have to contribute to this. However, if you have more than five or 10 employees, then you have to contribute 3% match to their whatever their contributions are. So again, this is great if you're an employee, right? But if you're a small business owner, it creates an additional burden when you're trying to grow and oops, now you're going from five employees to six or you know four employees to five and now you're subject to paying into these things. But don't get scared. I see worried faces, don't get scared. It's not, it, it's really not a lot. Like the uh, family, it's like I said, it's half a percent. So it, it's, no, it's actually less than half a percent that you have to pay into this. So it's very low. So Ari, you have another question. Employee retention credit. Yes. So again, this is a little bit beyond the scope because most of my business owners are not employers. I'm going to defer to you on that because I actually have not done, I usually outsource for the ERC. So I'm going to let you talk on that a little bit more. So the, the ERC is just a credit on if you had employees during the pandemic, and you kept them employed, then there is a percentage of the wages that you paid them that the federal government will reimburse you. That percentage can be up to 70%. So it is a large credit. However, you had to have employees during the pandemic, you have to show that you had a loss from year to year. Um, so we're seeing less and less of that because by this point, pretty much anyone who had employees during the pandemic has already done their employer retention credit. We're kind of on the out on that. Do you know the deadline to claim that ERC? So that's a funny one because they made the deadline four months after you discover that you are eligible for this. Mm. So really it can be. Okay. I, mean, I like the, the IRS definitions of stuff. Reasonable wages. Yeah, they use these words that are, they leave a lot of room for interpretation. Yeah. You're awesome, Teresa. Thank you so much. I, I'm always like, I know where my limits are. So I appreciate you being here to jump in. And again, I'm, I'm used to working with the small businesses that don't have employees. They're in that tiny or small size. Um, and so this is really good to learn about these credits that affect employers, because I think that's one of the more expensive things that you can do as a business owner is um, yeah. hire and retain employees. And so how can we incorporate that into our taxes? Yeah, well, thank 